Oh God, we come to you giving thanks for all that you have given to us. The blessings of this day as we celebrate baptisms, as we celebrate reaffirmations, and as we remember those that we love who have gone before us and now rest in you. So Lord, we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a statement. And the statement is one that might blow your mind, especially hearing it from a pastor say it from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. And that statement is that God doesn't need anything from us. God doesn't need anything from us. I think that's something that gets caught in our minds when we think about stewardship and, and what it is that we do in the life of the church, that, well, I have to do something because God needs me to do that. fact of the matter is he doesn't need us to do anything. A few years ago, I had a a mentee that was uh, finishing up his time at seminary and he was working in a local church and, and, and he was very dismayed. He was dismayed because he, he felt like he wasn't doing what it was that God wanted him to do. And as we sat down and we talked, he said, I, Chris, I just feel like that I'm not doing enough to be in the position that I am. And I looked at him with a smile on my face, and I said, well, you're not. And he kind of looked at me, and he stopped, and he said, because we can never, we can never do enough for God. And that's okay, because God doesn't call us to do more and more and more and more and more. And I told him, the thing that God wants is you. That's all he wants. All God wants. And really, if we think about it, the, the main point of stewardship, when we talk about giving sincerely, is that we give ourselves fully to God. And, and I could tell this really confused him as I was saying this. And, and at that time, there is a, a group out there called 10th Avenue North. They're a, a contemporary Christian group. And uh, the song wasn't released on the radio yet, but Tracy was on a, uh, a trip, and she heard them sing, uh, releasing this new album, and they shared the song called Control. And the first time I heard it, I mean, it, it brought tears to my face because it really hit something, uh, hit, hit a nerve in me about my relationship with God. And I wanted to share with you like I did with him. Actually, I played him the song. I'm not going to do that. But I want you to hear the chorus of the song. And I have the words up on the screen for you to follow along as I read them. 10th Avenue, wrote, 10th, 10th Avenue wrote, North wrote, God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life as the way it should go. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. I give you control. And as we sat there and we listened to that song, I, I, I saw him really thinking about that and he said so so all I have to do is give God myself and I was like yes that's all you have to do is give God yourself everything else will fall in line after that but if we don't fully give ourselves to God we say to God you know what I can handle it myself I can take care of things on my own. I really don't need you to be a part of my life, but I'll say that you are just because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. If I were to think of a short answer about why it is that, that God calls us to be in a relationship with him, 
It comes down to the point that God wants to share with us the love of the triune God with us so we can then share the love of the triune God with others. Other ways we may say that is that we love gracefully to allow that love to fully infect our lives so that we may live our lives open to what God has for each and every one of us. That brings us to our scripture. Last week I told you that we were going to be spending the entire series in Psalm 50. So I want you to hear again Psalm 50 verses 1 through 12. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles or we'll have the words printed on the screen for you to follow along with as well. The mighty one, the God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, I just realized as I read that, it's kind of mixed up a little bit. So I uh, invite you to open up Psalm 50 and read that on your own. Because those words are very powerful words. Those words are words that call us and reminds us of who God is. There are words that I wish I had when I was in my 20s. My 20s were a mess. Financially, relationally. My 20s were some of those years that, you know, you, you think about of in your 30s, your 40s, and now being 51, and I go, I am so glad that those years are behind me. <clears throat> I got married when I was 21 years old, and I was blessed with uh, our, my son, Tim, who now is 29 years old and will be turning 30 in in May of this year. And you know, when you get married, you have all the the hopes and dreams of everything with that, but but my marriage didn't last. And part of the reason that I think my marriage didn't last is because well, we weren't very good financially. We 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 took a look at money as just something that was there that we could play around with. And these are my words here, so let me make sure I clarify that. We did stupid things. Like we would go to a, uh, a, a, a furniture outlet or a furniture store and we would see a couch that we really liked that you can actually customize a little bit. And we looked at it and went, ooh, that'd be really nice to have in our house. Not only would it be nice to have this couch in our house, but guess what? They had a special deal for people who came and bought the furniture. I think some of you may know where I'm going. No interest down, no payments for a certain amount of time. So guess what that meant? That meant that we got a free couch into our house that we didn't have to worry about for a certain amount of time. But then, as you all know, the bill comes due. And that brings strain and, and hardship on a relationship. But then other things started to happen and realized that we had to, to cover things here or there and that I found something that I found was extremely, that I would still say today, is one of the most evil things that is out there that anybody can get involved with and that are called payday loans. If you're not familiar with what a payday loan is, you, you go into a storefront 
and you, you write a check for like $125, and then they give you $100, and you date the check back to like the, like to the end of the month. And then when the end of the month comes due, guess what? They'll, they'll drop that paycheck into your bank account, and they'll take that $100 that you originally got, and they'll take the $25 interest on top of that. So as I'm balancing my checkbook, I realize that I didn't have that extra $25 to cover for what I spent before. So I found another payday loan place, and I got another payday loan to make sure that I was able to cover that loan. And then when that loan came due, guess what? I came to another payday loan. So I was going around to four or five different payday loan places to make sure that I was covering everything that I was spending. And I remember the time that I finally had to go to my mom and say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm buried. I can't do this anymore. And to have my mom help bail me out at that time. But even with my mom helping to bail us out, that didn't, cause, that didn't stop us from having to file bankruptcy and losing some of the stuff that we have, including a marriage. All of these things were happening while I was a very happy and well-done church member. I did a lot of things for the church. I, I, I sang in the choirs. I helped out with praise teams. I taught Sunday school classes, I did disciple Bible study, I did Stephen ministry, I did all of those things thinking that God would bless me for all that I was doing. But see, there was a problem. And the problem was that I wasn't giving God everything. I was giving God what I thought I could give to him but I didn't want to relinquish the full control in my life. That's where our scripture brings us today. Our scripture brings to us a reminder in verse 5 that says, Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. In other words, what God is saying, I want you to gather with me. And the way that you gather with me is that you bring your sacrifices to me and, and you lay them down as a call and answer to, to what I have done for you. Sacrifices play a very important part in the life of the Israelite people. And I think, personally speaking, I think that's something that I forgot in my life that I, I didn't want to do. Because, I mean, come on, honestly. Do we really want to sacrifice? Do, do we want to lay things down? But the people of Israel did this a lot. They, they, they had five different specific sacrificial offerings that they would give to God. The first offering that they would give is one that you may have heard of. It's the burnt offering. And what the burnt offering was, it was a way for them to express thanks to worship and give devotion and commitment to God, and it also was there for atonement for unintentional sins. Those things that we may not realize that we do, you, you, you did a burnt offering and you allowed that to cover your unintentional sins, but it also said, God, thank you. Thank you for what you have given to me. <clears throat> the second one is my favorite kind of offering. It's called a grain and drink offering. And what the grain and drink offering is, you, you would make a, a loaf of bread and you would take it and you would burn the loaf of bread as an offering, but then you would take whatever drink that you would have or whatever drink that you would make, and that first part, you would just pour it out on the altar, which is just kind of silly to me. This pouring a drink out on the altar. This was given so that we could give thanks for the first fruit of the field. Those things that, that they created those things that came from the earth, they knew that they had to give that back to God. Another offering was the peace offering, which was for thanksgiving and fellowship. It was shared by a, uh, followed by a shared meal. So we kind of like think of your Thanksgiving banquet or any time that we have a potluck in the church. Those are, are ways that we can have a peace offering. 
Then there's the sin offering, which is for atonement for sin, ranging for a rich person would be a female goat to a poor person who might be able just to give fine flour. And then, of course, the entire community would gather together to offer a young bull that would forgive the sins of the entire community. And then the final offering was a trespass offering, which was a cleansing offering from the filing sin, the fat portions offered to God, and then those who gave that offering would then take what was left and, and go eat that outside of the tabernacle as a way to say, God, we know that we have trespassed against you, and we know that we have been cleansed by your love and mercy. And we share in that together. Each offering allowed an opportunity for the people of God to share what God was doing in their lives with others. Each of these offerings involved a gathering of God's people, not because God needed anything, Psalm 50 is very clear that, that God it didn't need any of that. If we go back to uh, what verses 7 through 12, I'll have them back on the screen for you again. It says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry... I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. Gather to me all this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. So why do we sacrifice? Or specifically, as we talk about stewardship, give our tithes and offerings to God. It's one word. It's control. It's because we want to have control over our lives and saying to God, I give control over to you. So in 2000, after I celebrated my 10-year class reunion, I made the trip down to Texas to start seminary. And some of you may have heard this story before. I, I started to work at a church down in uh, around the Colleyville area, and I was the children and youth music director, and I did some work with the youth ministry at the time. This was when I was about 28, 29 years old. A and I was there working in the church, doing anything and everything that I could just to make sure that I was following the rules and everything. And then, and then one day, <coughs> the senior pastor called me into his office. And he sat me down in front of his desk, which is why if you come to my office, we never sit around my desk. I always try to sit in those chairs because I hate sitting in front of a desk and having somebody in front of me. But that's another story for another time. But he sat me down in front of his desk and said, Chris, I noticed uh, one thing. As we are doing our stewardship campaign, guess what you're not doing? I went, what? Well, you're not giving anything. I said, well, well I can't. I don't, ha I don't have the resources to do that. There's, there's no way in the world I can do that. I said, well, you know, if you're going to be a part of this church, you need to give something. And that made me mad. How dare you? Know, you can hear the, the inner dialogue going, how dare you tell me I have to give anything? I'm giving all of this other stuff for the church. And, you know, I, he doesn't understand what it is that I'm trying to do. So I, I look for another job. I looked for another job because I, I, I didn't want to have that responsibility of making sure I did that, but I also felt like God was calling me to another area of ministry. And I received a job at, in Gainesville where I was doing youth ministry. But the pastor of the church in Gainesville did something different than the pastor in Colleyville. The pastor in Gainesville invited me to be a part of the stewardship campaign. And I saw things during that stewardship campaign that absolutely blew my mind. I saw women who were widowed that made sure that they gave a full 10% of their offering to the church. I saw people who I knew were struggling with this and that who made sure they gave to the church. And I looked at my own finances. And from that moment on, I said, if these people can relinquish control in their lives of their finances and give 10% to God, surely I can give 10% as well. 
And from that moment on, I started to tie. But I tell you the story not to say, oh, look at Pastor Chris, how awesome he is now compared to when he was when he was in his late 20s. I tell you this because when I released control of that in my life, I felt God's presence in my life. I'm not saying that there is a magic connection between giving and, and everything going well in your life, because believe me, not everything has gone well in my life since I started tithing, or since Trace and I started tithing. But there was one thing that I felt that Ruth talked about. There was a peace. There was an understanding. There was this feeling that, that God was the one who was doing a work in me, and I was allowing that work to change me, to help me grow, to help me experience the love of God in a new way that was making a difference not only in my life, but it was making a difference in the life of those around us. So, what might it be, li what might it be like to be so filled with appreciation for God's blessing that we can't contain it. That's how I feel right now. I feel like that God has blessed me with so many things. One of the biggest blessings is definitely being the pastor of Royce City Methodist Church. And there are times that I can't contain it. Yes, there are times that I'm drained and I'm frustrated and I'm angry or worried or all of those type of things, but we all have that in our lives. But the blessings that God has given me overflows in my life. And I want to make sure that we share that together. This week, tomorrow to be exact, uh, those who are members of our church will be receiving a letter from me. Make it there Tuesday or whatever. But we're mailing them out tomorrow. And in that letter, there will be two commitment cards. One is a financial commitment card. One is a service commitment card. I invite you to take these and, and, and not try to do something with them right away. But I invite you to pray over them. As Ruth said, sincerely get down on your knees and say, how am I to respond for all that God has given to us? The, the service card is a lot more cleaned up than what we've had in the past. It's very simple things for you to check to be a part of in the life of our church. The financial commitment card has a, a little bar, uh, has a little chart on the back. Because for me, whenever I finally understood what 10% of my salary meant, I went, oh, I can do that. So, so there's a chart on here that goes all the way from 1% the 10%, so you know that of $100, I'll make sure I get it right this service, I didn't last service, 10% of that is $10. And get that is an offering given to God to share his great love and mercy for us. We do this. We remember the sacrifices that God has given to us and the sacrifices that we share with others. When we come to this table, when we partake of the bread and the cup, when we are reminded of what Jesus has done for us so that we can share that love for others. I pray that as we continue to move through this campaign, that we say, God, I give you control. I, I give you all that I am. And if it's not 10%, if it's 5%, if it's even 1%, it's given fully for you so that your will may be done and that my life may reflect your goodness to the world around us. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you that, that when we open our arms to you, you open your arms to us. And God, we know that even if we don't open our arms to you, your arms are open wide for us, welcoming us, inviting us to come in. So we come to this table, relinquishing control in our lives, opening our hands to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ so that we may share that to the world around us. And we pray this 
in Jesus' name. Amen.